Hello everyone, I'm Patrick. I'm doing my PhD at the University of Oxford and I will present my poster titled Sequence Associated Mechanistic Insights into DNA Fragility. Uh, so genomic insertion and deletion alterations, these are the second most significant type of DNA modifications after point mutations, they occur through DNA strand breaks. And DNA strand breaks, uh, they happen naturally in cells, for example, replication stress or through external factors like radiation. Uh, cells typically have a really efficient way of repairing themselves if a strand break does occur, but if these strand breaks are left unrepaired and they accumulate over time, they can lead to genome instability and is also very linked to early cancer development and progression. Uh, but unlike point mutations, uh, it's not really well explored how uh, the following question, which is how does the DNA sequence actually influence the formation of a strand break? And how does this differ depending on the condition under which the DNA breaks? Uh, so we can address this question because we have really good computational tools these days and also really good uh, sequencing techniques that are able to map DNA strand breaks at single, single nucleotide resolution. So moving on to the right hand side here, um, there are three questions I want to address in today's poster. The first one I've already alluded to, which is how does the DNA sequence influence the formation of a DNA strand break? The second question is, can we quantify the DNA sequence fragility for different types of breaks? Uh, the DNA can break under many different conditions, depending on where it is in the cell cycle, the cell line, the environment, just the, the, so many different factors that influence how susceptible a DNA sequence is towards forming a break. And if we perform this calculation, or if we're able to quantify this for many different conditions under which the DNA breaks, we capture huge variation and this hopefully is really really good for input into a machine learning model which leads us to the third question which is can we develop a generalized fragility aware machine learning model um, the idea is that this model is then predicts uh, is able to predict uh, how susceptible a region is towards breakage high fragility low fragility that sort of um, goal so moving down to the methodology, there are three blocks here. I want to draw your attention towards the left-hand side first, uh, the methodology, which addresses the first question. Um, to be able to quantify the ranges of influence, the first thing we need is data, uh, really good data. So um, I'm not actually running any uh, experiments in the lab. Instead, I rely on publicly available data sets. So, I'll just use one example data set. Uh, this could come from the NCBI Geo database, or it could come from a paper that's been published and maybe they deposit as part of paper. Uh, either way, the what I want to have is data sets that are processed and that tells me exactly this is the location at which a break was found in the study. So, uh, to analyze this, uh, what we do is, uh, well, we, we have all of the different uh, breaks happening in, in, in that given experiment. The first thing we do is we align all of the breaks to the origin of the cleavage. Uh, and we look at the chimeric patterns. And we uh, perform the same calculation by going 500 bases up and downstream of where the original break was found because we wanted to look at what are the chimeric patterns at and near the break, and what are the chimeric patterns if you are going far away from the break. Uh, so if we cover a one kilobase region, uh, if you have a good sequencing technology mapping at single nucleotide resolution, you should hopefully see some interesting patterns here. Then, once you, once you do this calculation, you then want to basically look at two, uh, any two neighboring positions and see how different are these chimeric patterns. Um, the idea is that, well, again, going back to the first question, uh, does, uh, also how does the DNA sequence influence the formation of a break? You would expect that if there's any sequence influ influence, that the influence is probably greater if you are nearby the break, and probably less so if you are really far away from the break. And hopefully this methodology is able to capture this. So if I uh, zoom into this poster, Uh, this is the plot that you can see where uh, if you zoom really far and you can see this gray line in the background which is basically comparing the chimeric patterns between any two neighboring positions uh, zero is where the break happens um, and 
you can see that it has this characteristic shape uh, where you have a peak in the middle and you have this asymptotic decay on either side uh, and it's symmetric. And so now that we're able to calculate this, what do we actually do with this? Um, uh, well, I've already pointed out two interesting characteristics of this. You have the peak in the middle and it's symmetric. Uh, so we want to extract some useful statistics out of this because at the end of the day, we want to quantify the range of influence. Um, and to do that range, uh, sorry, to calculate that range, we can uh, fit Gaussian curves to this data because it looks sort of normal. Um, and if it doesn't work with the Gaussian distribution, we can incrementally use more complex distributions. But the point is we want to fit some sort of curve to this data and extract ranges from that curve. So it turns out that uh, if we fit three separate Gaussian curves, we get the orange curve in the background. So you can um, see this orange curve in the background that nicely overlays the gray um, line. Uh, what, is this gray, uh, what does this orange curve actually do? It is a, it's a combination of three Gaussian curves. So you have Gaussian curve 1 plus Gaussian curve 2 plus Gaussian curve 3. If you sum them together, you get this orange curve. What this also means at the same time is that we can look at each of the components separately, which is what you also see this uh, on this plot here. So you have this uh, red curve, you have this blue curve, and you have this really sharp peak in the middle, which is also a curve. And if you sum them together, you get this orange curve in the background. And so what this tells us that there seems to be, for this example uh, data set, uh, there seems to be three separate independent range effects that influence the formation of the DNA breaking. Um, and we can extract the range by using the 95% confidence interval um, of the Gaussian curve. Now, this is... Uh, just one example data set and just for the purpose of this it doesn't really matter what the data set is it's just i'm just illustrating um, how the methodology works and then the point is then uh, we get data uh, publicly available data sets that have been processed or we need to process ourselves but ideally they're already processed uh, and it tells us exactly where they the positions the location of the breakpoints and we pass them through our methodology uh, our, through our workflow as i've just been describing here um, and this is where our first set of results are illustrated in the middle block here. And, uh, and uh, we perform the same calculation. So we calculate the neighboring uh, K-meric patterns. We fit Gaussian curves as many as possible. Um, and uh, we look at how similar any two given experiments are based on the overall range of influence. What is this overall range of influence? This is this orange curve in the background, uh, as you can see here. And because if you look at any two experiments, experiment A, experiment B, if you look at the overall range of influence, um, how similar are these? Uh, the idea is that if they are really similar, then they will be clustered uh, close together. And if they are dissimilar, they will be clustered far away. So this is basically the point of this plot here. Um, and really what's, what I want to draw your attention to is uh, the second bullet point is that our method effectively capture similar break types through purely sequence context information. And I think this is actually quite interesting because in our methodology, in this calculation, it only looks at basically one column, which is uh, the column of location breaks. Um, nothing else. There's no training involved. There's no, there's, there's no machine learning involved. It's just, you know, um, the location of the breaks. That's it everything else is the same. So uh, the fact that uh, similar break types actually have similar overall range effects is quite reassuring to see because we know where we got the data from. We know how, like in that experiment, the experimental groups, they will have studied the DNA breaking under this condition and they will have reported this. So we can label them as such, but our methodology is able to capture this as well. So I think this is quite, quite nice. Um, and we can, because there are multiple range effects taking place, we can look at how much each range contributes to, towards the full range effects. And you can see here that the short range has a really high peak. It's quite shallow, but really high peak compared to some of the other curves. And you can see how much this contributes to the orange, or orange curve in the background. Uh, and it turns out that the short range effect contributes the most, which uh, biologically makes sense because you would expect that, for example, uh, if an enzyme targets a specific region, um, specific sequence, you will probably expect that the short range has the biggest contribution. There'll probably be some 
uh, erroneous breakages happening nearby the range and uh, nearby the target sequence uh, depending on the condition but uh, you would expect the short range to be the uh, to have the biggest contribution uh, and this depends obviously on the condition that it breaks in and so you see a good variation here um, so now that we know so now that, now that we can quantify the range of influence and we can say that for the most part short range has the biggest contribution uh, we now actually want to zoom into this short range and see, okay, well, w what sequences are actually more susceptible to boards breaking and which sequences are less susceptible to boards breaking. And to do that, uh, we go back to our curves. We, you know, we can actually just directly look at this plot and we can see that uh, we can sample k-mers um, that happen at the location of the break and sample k-mers, so this is our broken population essentially, and we can sample k-mers that are far away from the location of the break that have little to no influence. And we can confidently sample them because we perform this calculation here. And um, we compare those two populations, broken camer uh, sequence population and non not broken camer population, we do a statistical comparison between them. And we can find out which camers uh, are more susceptible to breakage and which are more resistant towards breakage. Again, this is not generically stating that this set of cameras are always more susceptible, but more that under this specific condition, um, the these set of cameras they're more susceptible to break, towards breakage. This is um, I want to highlight. So let's go to the final block here on the right hand side. This is uh, summarized as a heat map. So on the rows you see all of the different experiments that I was able to get some data from, publicly available again, and they're clustered by similarity of the overall profile on the rows. And on the columns, you have all of the short range sequences um, clustered by similarity. And really what I want to draw your attention to is that I, sh I should point out that um, if a sequence is susceptible towards breakage because it's a, uh, a scale Z score, it will be illustrated as red. And if it's more resistant towards breakage, it will be in blue. And one thing that I think pretty interesting to see here is that uh, what might be under one, if the DNA breaks under one condition, example, this block in, in the bottle, in, in, the, in the bottom here, um, red means more susceptible to breakage in that condition, but the same set of cameras are more resistant towards breaking under a different set of conditions. Uh, and this is nicely captured in this calculation here. And secondly, uh, this variation or this diversity in profiles is really prime opportunity to use for uh, to, to train a machine learning model and so at this point um, we now have we can quantify the range of inference we can quantify uh, which short range sequences are more susceptible or less susceptible towards breakage under a given condition and uh, we can now use machine learning to hopefully predict again to uh, question number three can we develop a generalized fragility model that's uh, what we're striving towards. And uh, this is goal number three. I'll just move my um, uh, video here. And so this is point number three. So before I go into the first bullet point, I want to focus on this uh, illustration here because uh, this is the workflow of the machine learning model. So we, from our work, so the, all of the previous work has some relationship with uh, this step here. So we have the three ranges of influences, short, medium, long range for each of them we extract different features because they likely have some different biological importances uh, that we want to uh, really focus on. So in the short range, we have the heat map, these actual k susceptibilities towards breakage. The medium range is probably related to uh, some structural features or uh, biophysical parameters. So this could be the energy, so hybridiz hybridization energies, for example, which is illustrated here, or it could be uh, um, the presence of G quadruplex structures, which is also linked to genome instabilities. Uh, and then also the long range effects here, it's more about the overall, the sequence composition and the overall flexibility of the DNA. Uh, the flexibility will be also governed by GC content and how easy it is to fold and form open and closed chromatins and counting cameras in that region. So those will be features extracted in the long range. All of these features are important. Um, and really for the machine learning model, uh, we want it to find some inter or intra relationships between all of these different features. Uh, we use a the LightGBM framework for this, 
And now to zoom back out again to the first bullet point, because I always highlighted the generalized part of the generalized fragility model. How do we make it generalized? Well, for this, we train the model on strand breaks linked to cancer. We use the cosmic database for this uh, because hopefully it improves our understanding of general sequence fragility, capturing complexities beyond any single specific breakage mechanism. Because sure, we can use this model and just fit uh, any of these data sets to it, uh, and it works quite well. Uh, it's not on the poster, but happy to discuss this later on, but uh, it, it's not general in any way because we know that the DNA broke under a very specific set of circumstances that led to the breaks forming these regions. That's not generalized in any way. Uh, we could, for example, you know, take multiple completely separate conditions under which they break, but then again, let's say I sample four of them, there will still be just four distinct mechanisms and still not general because but the thing is with cancer we know that cancer is uh, such a complex phenomenon where so many different factors come into play and um, so many domino effects need to happen basically where if we know from the cosmic database in this case if we know that uh, position x is causally linked to cancer y or disease x you know this is really good uh, we know that there is a complex general mechanism hopefully being able to capture uh, if we just train our model on this. So our model is then a classification of whether a given position breaks or not breaks because we are using all of the work so far is using sequencing technology at single nucleotide resolution. So we auto predict at single nucleotide resolution. And we have a roughly balanced data set of uh, true and controls and um, breaks. And this is basically the performance that we get using the light GBM model. Uh, it's quite good, I think. Uh, so 89 uh, area under the uh, rock curve. And uh, for, well, now that we have the generalized DNA fragility model, the question is, well, what do we do with this? Um, the most obvious thing is that, that I want to highlight is, okay, well, we, we have this uh, method where we can calculate the range of influence, we can calculate which sequences are more susceptible towards breakage or not. But the problem is, if you don't know, if, if you let's say have a new DNA sequence sequenced, um, you don't know where all of the breaks happen, unless you do your vigorous studies, but like for each sequence separately, it takes time and probably is quite expensive. Um, if you don't know this, you can't do this calculation, uh, this heat map that is generated on the right hand side, you need to have some sort of model that, that predicts, okay, well, these regions are more likely to break. These regions are more resistant to breaking based on all of the features and understanding of fragility so far. And overall, this sequence, you know, is, let's say, more fragile than if I were to compare it to sequence X. So that's basically the, idea, the, the, the goal that we're striving towards, like the ambition, the the hope that we have for this model. And so one example um, application would be virus fragility, for example. So we know that DNA viruses or RNA viruses, uh, they uh, will integrate, well, they will invade uh, cells and they will integrate themselves into the cells. Uh, what if the model is able to predict that certain, you know, this, this group of viruses, their overall sequence composition seems to predict that it is a more fragile than some of the other ones. Because it's more fragile, um, and we know that the, these viruses, they will integrate into your uh, nuclear DNAs. Um, does this high fragility translate into our genome also becoming more un like destabilized as well? Uh, which is obviously, and genome instability is linked to cancer development and progression. So th I think this will be one application that, that I would like to explore and I'm currently exploring at the moment. Uh, another thing could be, for example, delta fragility, the effect of mutations on sequence fragility. Again, coming from the cosmic database, we know that uh, in this position, we know, for example, uh, this stretch of the DNA sequence was deleted and this is causally linked to this cancer. Let's say breast cancer. And uh, well, with our model, we can then look at the sequence and also the surrounding sequence and calculate the fragility of that before the mutation happens and after the mutation happens. 
I am sure there are probably some sequences where the mutation led to higher fragility, so it became much more unstable, and possibly, in terms of biological implication, might actually mean that that mutation resulted in an autocatalytic process of almost having a domino effect of causing more or leading to more fragile regions in the genome and that maybe had some knock-on effects. So I'm sure there will be some interesting patterns that we can extract from this and this is uh, some of the model applications. So um, just to conclude the work so far, so uh, we've identified that there are three up to three distinct ranges of influence, short, medium, long range uh, towards and they all influence the formation of break. If we zoom into the short range, we can quantify uh, which sequences are more likely to break than others. And uh, we can use all of this information to develop a feature-based, uh, pu purely sequence-based, um, fragility-aware machine learning model uh, with hopefully some promising applications to cancer genomics and more. Uh, I am Patrick. I'm from the University of Oxford. I'm going to be present physically at the um, at the conference. So I'm hoping that some of you find this work interesting and would love to have some of your comments, uh, some discussions. Maybe, maybe, maybe if you're working in a similar field or in the same field, would love to have some co collaborations as well. So thank you very much for listening and hope to uh, speak with you soon. Thank you. Bye bye.